you are all doing very well. Uh, we are here today again with Fazbear and Doxy. Good job, thank you. So we're starting off without our bandanas today, which is we're going to start off with a little bit of painting. So you can see in the back over there we have the paintings that these guys did in their last session. So Fozzie did this one with the, uh, the red and the black and the brown. And then Doxy did this one that kind of looks like the sunset, the uh, blue and the pink. So they did a great job. But we're going to go ahead and do something a little bit different today because not only can you have the dogs paint pictures like that, but you can also add to the pictures yourselves. And we've seen this. There's a lot going around about it on Facebook that you see every now and then. But it's something neat that you can do with your dogs at home if they allow uh, their feet to be touched. So normally I would have Doxy and Fozzie uh, paint by themselves. But today I'm going to be helping them out a little bit so we get nice good prints. Thank you. Good job. So Doxy with his fluffy feet uh, are very, very nice paint brushes. So we'll go ahead and just push down on the canvas a few prints here. Good job. All right, that looks very good. Good job. Okay, excellent work, Doxy. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and wipe off his foot. Now what we're using is tempera paint. Uh, it's washable, non-toxic. And of course, after his sessions today, uh, both of these guys will be getting a bath. So we make sure to get all that off of their feet so they don't lick it or anything like that, but it's non-toxic, so it doesn't hurt them. Good job, Doxy. Okay, and then I'm going to have you sit down right here and wait, and we'll have Fozzie do some. All right, Fozzie, let's go. Good job. All right, Fozzie, and sit. Good. Stay. Of course, Fozzie has much bigger feet than his brother does. Okay. Good. Good job, Fozzie. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and wipe off Fozzie's feet now, too. And then we'll go ahead and start our first book here. We can put the bandanas on. Good job, Fozzie. All right, so we'll let this dry for a little bit. Looks pretty good so far. And uh, then the next time on Monday, I'll show you what we can do with this make this uh, even more beautiful than what these guys have already done. So I think they'll really like how we, uh, we can modify their picture here. We're starting off with our older reader book today. So this is Time Cat by Lloyd Alexander. And we've been reading this story for a few sessions now. I'm doing it chapter by chapter. So it's about Jason and his cat Gareth, who is a black cat with an orange or uh, orange eyes and a white mark on his chest. And he has the ability to travel with his friends through time. So he is currently with Jason in Egypt, and they are trapped uh, in a room about to meet the pharaoh Netrket. We will find out what happens. Uh, with this story. On chapter three. Chapter three, Netterket. The heavy stone door swung shut behind him. Jason beated it with his fists. He had never trusted the oily words of the chief scribe. 
How, Jason thought furiously, had he let himself be tricked so easily. He threw himself against the unyielding door, then exhausted, dropped to the ground. Now Gareth was gone. Jason would spend the rest of his life in the stone cell in Metriquette's palace. The boy hid his face in his hands and his shoulders shook with sobbing. At least, he consoled himself, the Egyptians loved cats and Gareth would be well looked after. To Jason's surprise, a little while later, the door opened and a sub-minor scribe peered in. Jason scrambled to his feet. Behind the sub-minor scribe were two guards who took him by the arms and marched him from the cell down one of the hall of columns after another until Jason lost track of them all. In a huge room at the end of one corridor, on a platform topped by a carved and decorated throne, sat King Metroket. Beside the king stood slaves with fly whisks and feathered fans on jeweled poles, musicians with trumpets and cymbals, and the chief scribe himself looking sour. In front of the throne sat Gareth. The cat Jason saw was watching Netriket in much the same way that he would watch a beetle or something else that interested him, but didn't interest him very much. Great king, live forever, said the chief scribe. This is the wretch we found lurking behind the statue. Perhaps his presence here will help. We shall see, said Netriket. In his high headdress and robes, arms crossed in front of him and holding the shepherd's crook and the flail of divine authority, the pharaoh looked no different from the statues in the throne room. But Netriket's face was dark and frowning. He looked, Jason thought, as if he never stopped being angry. I command this cat to play and entertain the pharaoh, shouted King Netterket at the top of his voice. The musicians clashed their cymbals. The slaves cried, life, health, strength, and the fly whisker whisked as fast as he could. Gareth did not move. Well, go ahead, boy, hissed the chief scribe. Make the cat be entertaining. Jason hesitated, then knelt on the floor beside Gareth. One of the slaves tossed down a toy, a bejeweled mouse on a golden chain. Jason pulled it back and forth in front of the cat, but he could tell from the set of Gareth's ears and whiskers that he was in no mood for games. Jason dropped the toy and shook his head. He doesn't want to, he said. I'm afraid there isn't anything I can do. Netterket looked angrier than ever. I command this cat to purr and make himself agreeable to the pharaoh, he shouted. Once again, there was the clashing of cymbals and the cries of life, health, strength. The chief scribe took out a clay tablet. So it is ordered, he said. So it is written, and so it shall be done. Garrett still did not move. Jason shrugged hopelessly, then picked up Gareth and put him on Netterket's lap. The king began stroking him, but Gareth put down his ears and squinted his eyes. He wriggled out of the pharaoh's arms and leapt to the floor. Aye, Netterket put his thumb to his mouth. One of Gareth's claws had accidentally scratched the king, and the pharaoh's braided beard shook with rage. I'm sorry, Jason said. He doesn't feel like playing or being agreeable right now. It's nothing personal, he added quickly. It's just the way cats are. It's obvious, said the chief scribe, that the boy is useless. Return the cat to Bubastus, ordered Netterket. He does not please me. Continue your search. And the boy, asked the scribe, the sacred crocodiles are always hungry, he suggested cheerfully. Netterket closed his eyes and nodded. So it is ordered, said the chief scribe, making another note on his tablet. So it shall be done, he gestured to the guards. Once again, Jason was seized and hustled down the vast corridors. He clung to Gareth and pressed his cheek against the class, cat's glossy fur. I don't care what they do to me, Jason whispered, frightened though he was. I'm just glad you didn't entertain the pharaoh just because he ordered it. You be the way you are. That's all that counts. Don't worry, Jason added. The sacred crocodiles probably won't be hungry anyway. Jason heard a shout behind him. The guard stopped. It was Netterket himself, waving his crook and flail. Return the cat! Return the boy to me! As Jason and Gareth entered the throne room, the cymbals clashed again, the trump trumpets blew, and the slaves began plying their fans. Stop that ridiculous whisking, Netterket commanded. Get out, all of you. You too, he said, pointing his flail at the chief scribe. 
In the empty hall, Nedrakhet seemed too tired to climb the steps to his throne. Instead, he slumped down the edge of the platform. He took off his headdress, his wig, and to Jason's amazement, even his braided beard. Without them, Nedrakhet didn't appear half as angry as before. For the last time, he said, are you sure there's nothing you can do? It's happened with every cat they brought in. All my subjects worship me. I'm a god, you know. My slaves are building the finest pyramid in Egypt, so things will be comfortable for me in the other world. But I can't find a cat to sit on my lap. And after all, who are both sacred, it's beyond me, absolutely beyond me. Nedrakhet looked so discouraged and unhappy that Jason could not help feeling sorry for him. You can't imagine how I've longed for a cat of my own, Nedrakhet continued wistfully to stroke him and watch him play. When I was a child, I always had cats. They seemed very fond of me. Then after I became a pharaoh, they didn't seem to care for me half as much. Jason thought for a while. I don't know, he said at last. Did you wear that headdress and that beard before you got to be king? That might have frightened them. And another thing, he added, did you shout as much? Cats don't like being shouted at. Netterkett brightened a little. That might be it. Even so, Jason said, when you weren't shouting, you'd think they have come around again. Oh, they did, said Netterkett, but they'd never play or purr when I ordered. Did you expect them to, Jason said? No cat in the world will do that. But I'm Pharaoh, Netterkett said. I'm supposed to give orders. That doesn't mean anything to a cat, said Jason. Didn't anybody ever tell you? Nobody tells me, Netterkett said. I tell them. Besides, they were my cats, weren't they? In a way they were, Jason said, and in a way they weren't. A cat can belong to you, but you can't own him. There's a difference. Gareth, meantime, had padded over to the disconsolate pharaoh and now began to rub his head affectionately against Nedarket's ankles. Listen, the king shouted, then clapped a hand to his mouth. I mean, listen, he's purring, he whispered delightedly. But that's what I told you, Jason said. All cats are friendly if you give them a chance. Once in a while, they like to keep to themselves. They'll play and purr when they want to, and sometimes you have to wait. If you can understand that, I don't think you'll have any trouble at all finding a cat to please you. They'll please you just by being themselves. Gareth had hopped onto the vacant throne and sat there watching them. Considering how touchy Netrakit was about being feral, Jason rose and started to pick up Gareth. No, let him stay there if he wants to, said Netrakit. I have learned something this day. Not even Pharaoh can give orders to a cat. Later, Netrakhet summoned the chief scribe. In the royal archives, said the king, you have listed this cat as one of my possessions. That must be changed. Neither he nor any cat who shall live in the great house shall be called a possession. Pharaoh is not his master, but his host and privileged friend. So it shall be written, said the chief scribe. Netrakhet turned to Jason. I would be honored if you and your cat would choose to stay with me. We'd like to, said Jason, but we have a long way to go. Netrakhet nodded, so it shall be. From his neck, he took a golden onk and hung it around Jason's old neck. Go in peace, strange travelers, he said. You have made me wonder whether Bast herself did not send you. Outside the great house, Jason and Gareth followed a path along the river. Well, Jason said, I'm glad Netrakhet found out that it doesn't do much good to shout a lot of orders. Certainly not at cats, Gareth said or people for that matter. The air trembled in the sunset. Although far from Bubastis, it seemed to Jason that he could still hear the strains of the hymns of the great cat. You know, Gareth, he said, your whiskers do look like the rays of the sun, and I do think you could hold the moon in your eyes if you wanted to. So the Egyptians say, Gareth answered. Oh, Gareth, Jason whispered, why don't you try? Not right now, said Gareth. He winked, and Egypt vanished. Oh, all right, very cool. So next up on Monday, we will find out what happens in Rome and Britain, 55 BC. That'll be the next one. All right, good job. So our next story is called Little Yellow Dog Gets a Shock. And the words are by Francesca Simon, pictures by James Lucas. Little yellow dog trotted into the sitting room. Whoopee! This was his lucky day. The chair was empty. 
Ginger Cat was licking her paws by the window. Hi, Ginger Cat, said Little Yellow Dog. Hi, Little Yellow Dog, said Ginger Cat. Time for my nap, said Little Yellow Dog. He leapt into the chair. So did Ginger Cat. Uh-oh. Hey, off, said Little Yellow Dog. I got here first, said Ginger Cat. You did not. I did, said Little Yellow Dog. It's my turn. No, mine. This chair isn't big enough for both of us, growled Little Yellow Dog. Too right, get off, hissed Ginger Cat, giving him a great big push. How did I end up on the floor, said Little Yellow Dog. Hey, that's not fair. Roxy, can you point to the to Yellow Dog? Roxy, can you point to him? Point the yellow yellow dog. Good job. Little yellow dog had an idea. He crept up to the chair, sneaked behind, and... Ah! Shrieked little yellow dog. Ginger cat went flying. That's not fair. Nice, huh? Look out, it's the monster, yelled the little yellow dog. And he's coming to get you. On and on they ran until they were too tired to run anymore. Friends, said Little Yellow Dog. Friends, said Ginger Cat. We can share the chair, said Little Yellow Dog. Of course we can, said Ginger Cat. But when they saw the chair, they got a shock. Bad Rabbit was there. Oi, get off our chair, said Little Yellow Dog and Ginger Cat. It's a shared chair, said Bad Rabbit. Snuggle up. We all have to share the chair. The end. We know how that is, huh? We have to share our chairs and our couches too. Yeah, yeah we do. That's okay though, because it's good to share, isn't it, boys? And tummy rubs are good too, so says Foxy. Let well, that leg go in for a second. Good boy. So we're going to read Start Off on the Right Paw by Denise Fleck. So this is actually the second book in the series. I thought it would be a good one because a lot of people are adopting dogs or fostering dogs from shelters right now. And that's really good this time uh, to try and give those animals a good home when we're all at home to be with them. But it's very important to make sure that when you're adding a new furry family member to your family, that they get along well with those that you already have. So start off on the right paw and tell us a little bit about how to introduce a new animal to the ones that you have at home. So Denise Fleck, start off on the right paw. And we know her, so she actually signed her book. Emmy, Claire yelled from across the park. Rex is getting a sister. What, when, how? Mary Alice, long for Emmy, returned the squeal. My mom volunteers at the animal shelter and said we can adopt a dog who has been there for six months waiting for a home, Claire replied. Why has she been there for six long months, Emma questioned. She's seven years old and a breed that some people think wrongly is aggressive. 
Just like people misjudge Rexy, adopt seekers sadly assume this dog is too old or too strong. They haven't taken the time to know the canine underneath the fur coat, Claire explained. I'm glad I learned not to judge a book by its cover and adopted Mr. Rico from the shelter instead of buying a puppy mill dog from a pet store, said Emma. Mr. Rico is her um, older Labrador. We're bringing Rex to the shelter to meet his maybe sister to see if they like each other. Want to come, Claire asked? You bet, M.A. replied. We don't know her name since she was found roaming the streets, but I've been calling her bonsai since she's a Japanese Akita, Claire's mom told the girls. Akitas are very loyal, said Mary Alice proudly. I've been reading the debris book you gave me, Claire, she smiled. You're right, Akitas are also strong and willful. They need an owner who will take charge, Claire's mom continued. You should never judge a dog by its breed or its age, but every family must choose a dog that's best fit their ability to care for that dog for its whole life. Like if you hike, you can get an athletic dog, but if you prefer video games, an older and less active one would be a better choice, M.A. asked. That's the idea, Claire's mom laughed. But there are other things to consider. For instance, you have to brush a long-coated dog daily, like Doxy here. And if you live in an apartment, you'll need a quiet pet that won't disturb the neighbors when you aren't home. Speak. So he can be very loud sometimes. But at least he only does it when I tell him mostly. <laughs> if your little brother has allergies, you need to choose a dog that doesn't shed so much. And if your grandma comes for visits, you must take the time to train your dog not to knock her over. But we've done with these guys. I get it. You don't just pick the cutest puppy. To make sure you are really giving a doggy a good loving forever home while keeping all the humans happy too, you need to learn about the dog's personality and needs before choosing the best match for your family and for the dog. Mary Alice beamed. At the shelter, Emma thought, it looks the same, but I see it so differently than when I first came here to meet Mr. Rico. The noise and smell bothered me then, but now I wish I could take all the dogs home, give them baths, and let them play with my best buddy. Claire's mom and the kennel attendant smiled. We do need volunteers to bathe the dogs. A clean dog looks happier and is more likely to get adopted, the kennel attendant suggested. Oh, mom, could we ask Claire excitedly? Let me talk with Mary Alice's mom. It would be great for you girls to do community service, but it's a big responsibility, Claire's mom said. As they waited in the shelter play yard with Rex, an older white canine bounded in, pulling the attendant at the other end of the leash. Bonsai wagged her corkscrew tail, happy to be out of her small kennel. Looks like I'm going to teach Bonsai to walk nicely on the leash like Rex does, Claire said. The kennel attendant instructed the girls on how to walk Rex alongside, but not letting him greet Bonsai at first. If two dogs don't start off on their right paw, it can be difficult to make them like each other, she explained. If they listen to our commands and remain calm, we will let them sniff and officially get acquainted. They're behaving bow wow wonderfully, exclaimed Mary Alice. Yes, they are, smiled the kennel attendant. But keep an eye on them. Make sure they each have their own space and receive equal attention from all of you while both sides settles in. Oh, Mom, Claire rolled her eyes. We get it. Though, we need to make sure to be cautious that it might take time. Claire's mom reminded the girls, you're putting two strangers together and asking them to live in peace. What if I made you move in with one of those girls you two gossip about and they're expecting you to get along? After a long walk to tire the dogs out, they all walked into the house together. Claire gave both canines cookies and showed bonsai to her bowl and bed. Watch their body language, girls. If they get their hackles up, lower their tails, stare at each other, or begin to growl, stay calm, stay firm. Say a firm no and alert me at once, Claire's mom ordered. What are hackles, Mary Alice asked. The hair on their back and their neck, when it puffs up, it could mean they're upset, whispered Claire. Bonsai curled up on her bed while Mary Alice stroked her fur. I can't wait for Mr. Rico to meet you, Lady Bonsai, she said. Lady Bonsai, Claire's mom smiled. 
That's the perfect name for our regal girl. The next morning, M.A. appeared on Claire's doorstep with Mr. Rico. Rex greeted him at the door with his usual waggy butt wag. The bonsai uttered, uttered a low growl and her hackles went up. Calmly, but with a sense of urgency, Claire's mom suggested, Mary Alice, why don't you and Mr. Rico meet us at the park? The dogs must be introduced on neutral turf like you did at the shelter. She grabbed her pet first aid kit and off they went. Bonsai felt threatened by Rico entering her new home, Claire's mom explained. Let's do this right and walk Rico alongside her like you did with Rexy. Mr. Rico whimpered anxiously to meet the lady dog. Bonsai remained quiet while watching Claire's mom who had the cookies. Good, now put Rico in a sit and I'll bring Bonsai over. Mr. Rico's tail thumped the ground with excitement. The dogs were then allowed to sniff, circling each other. Bonsai appeared cautious, but all remained friendly. Claire's mom breathed a sigh of relief. In love and continued training, Bonsai is going to grow into a wonderful friend, not only to us, but to Rex, Rico, and other dogs too. It is so important that people and dogs start off on the right foot, or right paw for that matter. They followed the dogs around the park, sniffing and playing when suddenly Rex squealed and began rubbing his nose frantically on the grass. What's the matter, boy? asked con a concerned Claire. I think he got stung by a bee, shrieked Mary Alice. No. Well, your mommy, Doxy, got stung by a bee one time. That was terrible. Calm, girls. Hold the other dogs while I take a look, Claire's mom instructed. She gently held Rex's face in her hands. Observing the swelling, then requested several items out of the pet birthday kit. Rexy weighed 55 pounds last week at the right, right, Claire, she asked. Right, Mom, Claire responded. You need to know your dog's weight to give him the correct dose of medicine, she informed Mary Alice. This is going to make our fellow sleepy, Claire's mom whispered as she gently pushed pills onto the back of Rex's tongue and made him drink water. Claire, you'll need to hold a cold pack on his face to stop the swelling while well, Mary Alice and I watched the other dogs. How's Rexy doing? Emma asked at school the next day. That was so cool how your mom knew to fix him up. I didn't know she was a vet. He's fine, Claire replied, but she's not silly. She just knows a lot about pet safety. She teaches pet first aid and CPR classes so that people can help their pets before they can get to the veterinarian. I want to learn, Mary Alice said excitedly. I'd do anything to make Rico feel better if he got sick or hurt. As they walked home that afternoon, Claire's mom pulled alongside them. I just came from your house, Mary Alice. Your mom and I think it would be awesome if you girls volunteered at the animal shelter. Awesome possum, the blonde-haired girl yelled joyfully. Can you also teach us pet first aid? The end. That was pretty good. And we have four doggies in our home. And we had to do the same thing to introduce them to each other to make sure that they got along. Luckily, ours are all very friendly with each other, so that's really good. Okay, boys. Let's see, shall we do some training next? All right. So we learned how to do and they teach people how to sit with their dogs and how to lie down. What do you think we should do next? You want to try to stay? All right, let's do that one. And again, whenever you're doing training with your dog, you want to make sure to get something that they really like to eat. Maybe a special treat, or you can do praise or petting. Something that makes them really happy and excited. And it's called positive reinforcement training. They get a reward. Yep, they get a reward if they do something right. Okay. Do we like that? Oh, yeah, we do. Good job. Let's get some fun. Stay. Good job. Good job. Okay. So we talked about sit. So it's going over the back of the head just like that. Good job. Then we talked about lie down, which is going underneath like that. 
and tucking it behind their leg. Good. Now once they know how to sit and lie down, then you can work on stay. And that's to keep them in one place. Alright, your boys. Sit. Stay. And come. Good job. Okay. So stay is very important. Back up, back, 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 back. Especially, like I said before, if you have a dog that might run into the street or something that might hurt him. So it's good to, to be able to practice the stay command. So how you work with that is you can start off with them in a sit or a down position, and then just stay a quick step away, and then come back and give them a treat. So you don't want to make it too far away because they'll want to come and follow you. They love to follow and be with their friends. And then once they understand that you take one step away and come back and you give them the food, then you can try maybe two steps away. <laughs> See, that was too much. Okay, let's try that again. And I didn't give them the word stay yet. Okay. And you can also do it for longer durations. So once they know that you're not going to be going away, you can start giving them the word. So in our case, it's stay. And our hand signal is just like that. So stay. And then you can do it for a longer time. Good. And then you can practice all different kinds of things with a stay. We call it proofing. So we have our friend. <laughs> Now you're showing off that. We have our friend Kit Perry, who does dog training. We work with her a lot. She's really great. She does creature coach animal training. And she has a YouTube channel, too. So if you uh, want to follow her, she does a lot of great work. But she kind of taught us how to do this sort of thing. So once you have a stay, once you have a dog that knows how to do stay, and then you can try proofing things. So instead of just uh, having back up, for instance, and go around, you can try going in a different direction. So that might be a little bit harder for them to go another way. And then once they understand that no matter which way you go, they still have to stay, you can try and go all the way around their back. And I have to step right over the top of them here. So that's really hard for them to do. You can go all the way around them. You can step right over them. And that way, you know that they are very, very solid. When you tell them to stay, you know that they're going to be able to do that and be safe. And then with the therapy dog test, they have a section on the test where they have to stay at the end of a six foot leash. In another section where you have to walk away, right now, stay. We have to walk away with your back to the dog, which is pretty hard for them to do. 20 feet and then call them to you. And sometimes if you get a little bit nervous, you might accidentally give them a tug on the leash that you don't mean to do. So it's very important to uh, work with them so that way if you actually give them a tug on the leash, they're not going to break that stay because you told them what to do. Just a little bit of stay. Stay. You can see, even though I told Fozzie to stay, even giving him a tug, he's not going to break that stay until I tell him to. Good job. So that's his release word is let's go. And that way he knows that, okay, we're done. And we can go on and do the, uh, the next thing. And usually that means he gets his reward. Of course, when we're on a therapy dog visit, or if we are uh, on the actual test, we can't get a reward beyond praise and petting dogs. I'm all excited now. Good boy. Yeah. All right. You guys want to do a little bit more? 
thumb. Good job. Normally it's all stretched out in the line, but it wouldn't be able to fit it all in the picture. Pepsi tunnel. Good job. There. All right. Bowser here. Bow. Good job. Okay. And these guys also have to know how to walk on a loose leash, so that means that they're not pulling me and that I'm not pulling them. Quasi, since he's the easiest one to see here. So you want a nice big curve in your leash like this when you're walking around. You want him to sit right next to you if possible. So we turn that into square dancing. So we can walk around the circle, and we can back up and move forward, and that kind of thing. And that way, he is not going to be pulling me, and he's got his focus and attention on what I'm doing. Good job. All right. Hey, boys. You want to do a fun little jump? And we'll see you in questions. I'll be you guys on that. Our audience, if we have any questions today. In the last part of our session here. Anybody have any questions to ask of these guys? Okay, so the question is the favorite places to be scratched. So for Doxy, he really likes to ride around here by his ears. And around his back here, right by the base of his tail. So that's his favorite place. He really likes that. And Fozzy Bear, as you've seen, he loves tummy rubs when he has to be in the mood for it. And he also loves the base of his tail being scratched. And in fact, if you do it just right, he starts dancing. <laughs> Here, Fuzz. Can you dance? Yeah. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> oh, and there's the dummy room. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Favorite places to visit? Well, they visit at Bear Mountain Library. And uh, also at uh, Reading Library, so they love going there. Fuzzy, come here. But uh, they also love to go to Valley Animal Center to the dog park. That's one of their favorite places, and they have lots of puppy friends there that they can play with. So they like that too. Any other questions? Okay, well, I think we're done. Good job. Good job, boy. Don't leave me hanging. Oh, good boy. All right. Can you say thank you? Good job. Can you say thank you to them? Yes, all right. Bye, everybody.